I love cooking, I love teaching people how to cook. I've been doing both for 30 years. To cook well, it helps if you love and value food, as that's where it all starts. My approach to cooking is simple and not new. Use the best ingredients you can get, get organized and follow the recipe. And that way, you'll be sure to get really wonderful results. I first tasted the soup I'm going to show you now in Laos when I was traveling a few years ago. And when I came home, I set about recreating that delicious flavor. Carrot soup is funny. You imagine it would be easy, but in fact, it can be difficult to achieve a really flavorsome result. In this combination with coconut milk and lemongrass, I think it works really well. When I'm buying my carrots, I buy them with the earth still on, as generally they have much more flavor than pre-washed ones. I'm going to cook the carrot, onion, garlic, and the essential lemongrass in this soup together, quite slowly to start off with. So I'm going to melt a little bit of butter to get things going. You could use a little coconut oil here as well if you wanted to, but not too much. And we're just going to let that come to a gentle foam. While that's happening, I'll keep an eye on it and I can prepare the lemongrass. So you want to just pull off the tougher outer leaves like that to get to the more tender center leaves because it's, it is a grass which grows wild, of course, in Southeast Asia. It can be quite tough, particularly the outer leaves. So I'm just pulling off the outer leaves. They are going to go in in a few moments. And then I'm going to thinly slice the actual stalk of the lemongrass itself. So my butter, as you can probably hear there, just starting to sizzle. Question is, have I enough time to finish my lemongrass? No, I think I need to get my onions and garlic and everything in here. Sliced onions, thinly sliced, sliced carrots, beautifully finely sliced, even though I say so myself. The chopped garlic, that means it's given me a little safety valve with my butter, because those ingredients will have cooled down the butter and prevent it from burning. So I'll just give them a little turn while I finish preparing my lemongrass. Keep your little fingernails tucked in, slicing backwards and forwards with your knife like a rocking horse moves, okay? So they go in like that, and the stalks then, they go in, and very importantly, seasoning. At the beginning, good pinch of salt, some pepper, and then a tiny pinch of sugar that just makes them taste more carroty. So just a small little pinch like that. Turn the vegetables so they're completely coated. A little bit of greaseproof paper or a butter wrapper to keep the steam in, and we get a lovely sweaty, Southeast Asian warm to the monsoon climate type day going on in the saucepan to give them everything they need to cook down slowly and to really, really draw out the flavor. So they will sweat away there 15 to 20 minutes. At that point then, we'll add in our coconut milk and chicken stock. So the lid has kept the steam in to prevent the vegetables from burning. Stir, lovely. Now, our chicken stock, you could use vegetable stock here as well if you wanted to. About 500 mils of coconut milk here, and you'll note that this one has got the cream on top, the lovely rich cream, and then underneath is the liquidy. You expect coconut to be pure white, but in reality, it's got a slight hint of gray, and that is perfect. So the whole lot goes in. Some might say, irritatingly, I need a little more than one tin. So I'm just going to take a little more out of my second tin. If you didn't want to open a second tin, you'll still have a very good soup. But if you do have coconut left over, it will keep in the fridge just for a couple of days. Some people even like it stirred up to get the thick mixed with the thin and on their cornflakes. That's up to you. I give that a stir and we can bring that up to a simmer because really the vegetables are pretty much cooked now and all we are trying to do is to get our coconut flavor in and our chicken flavor in and then when that simmers for a moment or two, I'm going to blend it because this is going to be a smooth soup. When the soup comes up to a simmer, take it off the heat and blend it to create a smooth, luxurious finish. So the soup is a lovely, smooth, sort of luscious puree, perfect consistency, so I need to taste, just to see if a little pinch of this or that will make it any better. It needs more salt, so a pinch of salt like that. It doesn't need any more sugar. I clearly don't want to over-season it. I just want it to taste really delicious. It's all about balance. And that last little pinch of salt has made all of the difference. It's really elevated it. And that is that. It's ready to serve. 
So a little of the coconut just sort of float it in on top like this. Or if you want to, you can go for mix the thick and the thin and you get more of a sort of a dribbly sort of effect. The little pale sort of dots of the coconut milk. Actually, that's rather good, I think. I'm going to put some of those on there as well. And then finally, if you're doing coriander leaves, coriander is the perfect leaf here. At certain times of the year, coriander has a really beautiful flower, and I would use those if they were around at the moment, which they're not, but very happy with the leaf. So this is filling, because carrot is rich in a way, but certainly rich when it's combined with coconut. So lovely, nourishing bowl of soup. Really delicious. Any time of the year, really. Nice. A few years ago, butchers had some difficulty selling shoulder of lamb as it was considered inferior to the leg and the loin. That has all changed as people realise that the shoulder is every bit as good as the prime cuts and in some ways actually better. The cooked lamb in this dish should be soft and melting and will be gently pulled apart for serving rather than being neatly carved. I suggest two sauces here, a garlicky mayonnaise that is thinned with some of the lamb cooking juices and a fresh tasting and piquant herb salsa. The two combine really well with soft, flavoursome meat. So the first thing to do is to get the lamb into the oven. And I'm using lamb which is local to my area here in East Cork. And the preparation could not be more straightforward. Make a few little incisions in the surface of the lamb. And that's going to encourage some of the excess fat to run out. So I'm only going in a millimeter into the fat. So a nice sprinkling of salt and a twist of black pepper and into the oven. So we start this off 180, 190 degrees for about a half an hour or so. And then we're going to turn the heat down to 160 and cook it in total for about three and a half hours. While that's cooking, you have plenty of time to go ahead and prepare your accompaniments. I'm going to make a salsa verde, if you like, or a green sauce. Conventionally, I would use a mixture of herbs there. However, at certain times of the year, the good lamb coincides with this fantastic ingredient called wild garlic. Both of these two varieties, I have two varieties here which I shall explain, are a member of the allium onion sort of family. So this little one here is sometimes called three-cornered leek. If you break one of the leaves, it's got three corners on it like this. And the flowers on this look like a white bluebell. Every part of the plant is edible, even the roots. The second wild garlic is this one, sometimes called ransoms, this one. And as you can see, the leaf is substantially different. It's a broader, for all the world, more elegant leaf, honestly. If you don't have wild garlic, replace it with more conventional salsa verde type herbs like mint, tarragon, parsley, maybe a little bit of rocket. Chop it finely, and as you can see, I'm using plenty of it, because salsa verde, as the name suggests, green sauce, should be lovely and green. It is without doubt best eaten on the day or a couple of days after you make it, but it does actually keep really well, because it is preserved for all the world in olive oil, and I'm using extra virgin olive oil. And of course, if it's extra virgin cold pressed, it also has many wonderful health properties. Okay, that is my garlic. The rest of the ingredients for the salsa verde, classic. Some capers and some anchovies. You could, of course, put all of these ingredients into a food processor and blitz them, and you will get a salsa verde. But I find that the slightly coarser chop, particularly of the anchovy and the caper, gives you a more piquant result. So pop that in there. Then I'm going to add in a little mustard cream mustard, and then my olive oil. And I'm not going to salt this until I taste it, because the anchovies and the capers are quite salty. Use my microplane just to zest a little lemon zest, and then we'll give that a stir. Now that looks green and beautiful. That's perfect. We'll put that to one side. That's a salsa verde. The second of the two sauces, I have some homemade mayonnaise here. We're going to take the mayonnaise and make it into an aioli. Whenever you hear the word aioli, you know there are two things definitely involved. There's mayonnaise and there's garlic. And I'm going to grate a little garlic on my slightly lemony microplane. It makes no difference. And I'm going to put this aside. There we are. Stir that in. And that is a basic aioli. But we're going to take it further with a little of our lamb cooking juices a little later. So 
I'm making a matchstick potato cake to go with the roast lamb. I'll just cut the potatoes into slices like that, and then cutting them into vaguely matchstick shape. So grease my pan with some butter. Pop your potatoes in, and then sprinkle a little salt and pepper as you go. Potatoes like salt. I don't want it, of course, to be over salty, but I want it to be properly seasoned. Plenty of pepper. Little more butter, just to melt down through the potato as it cooks. What I do want to do here is to trap in the steam. A pretty tight-fitting lid. So, then heat on. I started off at, you know, a reasonably high heat like that, sort of medium high heat. And then when I hear it starting to sizzle, I'm going to turn the heat down really low and let it cook really gently so the bottom gets beautiful and golden and then the potatoes are softened and tenderized by the steam which is created in the pan. While that's cooking, I'm going to make a lovely parsnip puree. I've cooked them until they are completely tender because we're making a puree, they must be cooked through. When I was straining them, I have kept some of the parsnip cooking water because I'm going to use some of that to loosen the puree so it's a lovely, soft, comforting consistency. Okay, so the strained parsnips, my saucepan is a perfect place to puree them. A little bit of cream, some curry powder. Curry powder and parsnip are spices and parsnip is a wonderful combination of flavour. Butter, and then very importantly, some of the parsnip cooking liquid going in like that. And to lift the flavour of everything, a few little drops of lemon juice. So, a few little drops like that. Now, don't over lemon it. I don't want you to think when you taste this lemon, I want you to think something nice going on there in the background. Puree this. I'm using my handheld blender. You could do this in a food processor as well if you wanted. Looking pretty good now. Stir it through it like that to make sure you haven't missed any lumps. So that's perfect. That's that. I'm going to put that aside and I can reheat it then when my lamb is cooked. So the lamb is cooked and looking beautiful. It's taken on loads of colour. And the other fantastic thing, there's lots of delicious juice in the bottom of the pan. Lift it onto a nice hot serving dish. Then pour the juices into a jug. Quite a lot of fat on here, so the maigre is very important. The cleverest chef in the world can't create the juice that the lamb has given us into the maigre, which is going to separate the fat from the pure meat juices. Let that sit just for a moment, because like Oil on a puddle, fat on this liquid will rise to the surface and then our maigre, which has got a little spout which holds back the fat, is just going to give us the juices. So pour, see that? I mean, if that's not mahogany, I don't know what to say. And the purpose of this juice is to flavour the mayonnaise, which we've sharpened up with our garlic, our aioli in other words, and also to just lighten it and to give me a sauce of sort of pouring cream consistency. Okay, let's taste. Colour looks terrific now. Yeah, that's really fantastic. The intensity of the flavour of the lamb, the small amount of garlic we used, and good quality homemade mayonnaise. And when paired with the salsa verde, the two work absolutely fantastically well. The parsnips I have heating. The only thing I would like to put on top of those at this stage are some coriander leaves. I've scattered them rather randomly over the top like that. So one remaining thing, we've got to turn out our potato cake. So it was cooking for 35 minutes, that's there, thereabouts. And you see the way lots of steam comes out of the pan, okay? That will have helped to tenderize the potatoes. So just check the potato is completely tender. Knife should just float down through the potatoes very easily like that. Turn those out onto a plate. One, two, three, go. Pop it down again. A little prayer at this moment could be appropriate. Pop it out, and there we are. Gorgeous golden cake. You can imagine how that crispy topping is going to be delicious with the lamb. So we're nearly there. In fact, we are there. The only thing to say at this stage is they, they're getting the lamb from the bone and onto plates. So you can use the tongs if you want to. You can use a carving fork. And I'll just use a knife, cut sort of portions like that. And you, with the a lamb shoulder, you have to sort of find your way around and then just pull off lovely unctuous pieces like that. Look at how juicy it is. That's all the lovely muscle tissue that's collapsed down. 
One final thing, if you've managed not to use all your wild garlic, I mean, it's the most beautiful stuff. It means your family or guests get to see what the wild garlic looks like. And don't forget that the little flowers are completely edible and quite delicious. They're like little garlic sweeties. This sounds like a sort of a contradiction in terms. And this would make a wonderful Easter meal, but actually at any time of the year, lamb in Ireland is good. So I hope you enjoy it. Trifoldry and I cooked in the Christmas programme elicited a huge response, perhaps as much for the sibling arguments over the correct usage of silver balls as for the recipe itself. I'm going to show you another trifle. Perhaps this is the start of a movement to reinstate this dish to its rightful place as a national favourite. It's definitely better if it's made a day in advance, and then the finishing touches of cream and appropriate decoration are quickly and easily achieved, providing there's no interfering sisters around, of course. I'm going to cook the rhubarb to start off the trifle, and I want to cook it until it's completely tender, but ideally still holding its shape. Early on in the year, when the forced rhubarb comes in, it's called champagne rhubarb, and it's a lovely sort of pale pink color, very delicate in flavor, that's really good as well. But I love this deeply colored rhubarb. So into a saucepan, tight fit, then some sugar. Depending on the time of the year, you can use less or more sugar. You definitely don't want to make it too sweet. And then really very little water. The purpose of the exercise of the water here is to prevent the rhubarb from just catching before it gets a chance to throw out its own juices. I like to put a lid on, something like a Pyrex plate or a glass plate or a glass saucepan lid, so I can just see through and I can see what's happening. I want the rhubarb, by the time it's cooked, still have some sort of semblance of what these pieces look like to start off with. Now I'm going to get the custard on cooking. So I've got some milk infusing with a vanilla pod. You could use vanilla extract and that will work perfectly. The other ingredients for the custard, as you'd expect, are eggs. I'm going to just break some eggs in here. What I want to do is save two of the egg whites. So in here I put two egg whites. So two egg yolks and a whole egg in this bowl, like that. Then to the eggs I'm going to add in some sugar and I need to whisk those until they get nice and light and fluffy looking. And I'm also always keeping a little eye on my rhubarb. So frothy, foamy eggs and sugar. And this is a flour thickened custard. So I'm putting in a little flour at this stage and just stir that in. Okay, right, turn the heat off under my rhubarb, which is starting to get rather Vesuvian in attitude. That's looking lovely. I'm going to take the lid off that because I want that to cool a little bit. The other element of the custard, of course, is the milk and the vanilla. Pour the milk onto the egg yolk and flour and sugar mixture. You'll find at the bottom of your saucepan your vanilla pod. Just cut it in half and then with the blunt side of your knife, scrape like that and you get that. It's like striking oil. That's where the intensity of flavour is and it's where the authenticity of appearance is in terms of a custard, because that gives the classic vanilla flecked appearance. So stir that in. And very importantly, this is going to go back into a clean saucepan, because when you boil the milk or infuse the milk with the vanilla, you get a little skin. And if you cook that twice, it's more likely to catch on you. We have to cook the custard, and because there's flour in the custard, it will thicken quite quickly, and you need to be very vigilant here. I'm going to use a whisk to keep stirring it. It will start to thicken quite quickly, and I want to break down the lumps as they start to form. This is called creme patisserie, or creme patissiere, as distinct from a custard with no flour, which is called a creme anglaise. Just going to get in with my wooden spoon on the bottom, just to lift up anywhere where I might misc with the whisk. See the way if you didn't whisk now, you'd be in trouble. Apart from the fact that it's thickened, allow it to come to a simmer and then let it bubble or simmer like that for a, for a good minute. All taste of raw flour will be gone by then. Okay, that's perfect, beautifully thickened and the perfume coming up or the aroma of the vanilla is fantastic. So I'm going to turn that off and allow that to cool for about five minutes. So I've got a single sponge like this, lovely, whisked up, egg-based sponge, and I'm just going to cut it in half horizontally. Don't worry if it's not absolutely perfectly cut in half, but on the other hand, the more neatly you do it, the better the proportion your trifle will be at the end. 
When you're putting the sponge into the trifle, you'd expect to put it in, you know, cooked side down. You actually do it in the opposite way, like thus. I'm going to press it in. So don't be afraid to have it looking rather ham-fisted, shall we say. That's absolutely fine. OK, I'll put that to one side. So I've got some lovely strawberries, which I'm just going to slice in to the rhubarb. And these give a lovely scented flavour. OK, that's good. Mix those through. And the slight warmth in the rhubarb is going to soften the strawberry ever so slightly. So I like to use a little bit of kirsch, cherry-flavoured eau de vie, quite neutral in flavour, add a little bit of excitement, shall we say. And then fairly gentle with the rhubarb, just not to break it up after we've gone to the trouble of trying to retain fairly recognisable pieces. Now, the remaining element of the custard are the egg whites. So I'm going to whisk these guys. So I want to achieve a nice frothy sort of light meringue. It's a way of getting air into the custard. Lovely. Two egg whites, a good sized bowl, good sized whisk. Look at the volume you get from them. It's really it's sort of remarkable. Now, add this into the custard. Give it a whisk like that, just in case any little lumps have formed just while it was resting. Mix in maybe a third or a quarter of the egg white first. That's preparing the heavier custard mixture because you've got heavier custard and very light air-filled egg white. And then we'll be a little more careful when we're folding in the volume or the bulk of the egg white. So more gentle folding now. I don't mind if the egg white hasn't completely disappeared because it will disappear in the actual composition of the custard. So that's it. I am ready to assemble the trifle. So half of the fruit in first and lots of the lovely juice. And then about half of the custard, lovely airy custard. Spread that over the top. OK, another layer of sponge. Cut side up, push it in, sort of squeeze it. You can even, if you want to, just tear it like that and get a little sort of overlap. Nice and tight. The rest of our fruit. I can smell the kirsch, actually, uh, which is really lovely with the rhubarb and strawberries. The other thing to remember, when you assemble a trifle like this, leave it to sit, ideally overnight. You could do it in the morning and eat it that evening if you want to, but it collapses in the bowl, which in my case is clearly going to be an advantage because it's getting to be a tight fit. The last of the custard. Don't worry if you can see little bits of rhubarb blinking at you. It can all be sorted out like that. So allow that to cool. So ideally, this has been soaking overnight. So I've got some softly whipped cream, so just sort of gentle little folds of cream. I can smooth it over in a moment. Just nice, like a little sort of organic swirl like that. OK, I think that's pretty good. Now the strawberries, which I've just cut into little eights, so they're like little spears. And I sprinkle them with a tiny little bit of sugar so they get a lovely glaze. I don't want them overly sweet. Gooseberries and elderflower is also a wonderful combination. Look like little dolmens. Then some flaked almonds. They make the most lovely, delicate little sound as they're hitting the cream. And then finally, a few lovely bright green pistachios. More texture, more flavour. I don't want too many of those. When you're serving this, then, good big spoon right down to the bottom of the bowl. So you're serving your guests, your family, your friends, a good proportion of everything that's there.